presence of the ancestors on the unceded, unceded traditional and ancestral shared territories of the Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh people. And we give them many thanks. And thanks to all of you, and to those of you watching on the live stream, for joining us today to launch Gladys We Never Knew, a new learning resource that will introduce children in schools across BC to the life and community of one little girl who tragically never came home from residential school. Gladys Chapman was a 12-year-old student at the Kamloops Indian Residential School when she died of tuberculosis in 1931. Her story was not told for decades afterwards, but we are now able to share it thanks to the commitment of Gail and Janet Stromquist, two of Gladys's nieces, who were both very passionate and talented teachers in BC and BCTF activists. We're also very happy that Gladys' siblings and other family members are here today with us to share in launching this resource that will ensure Gladys' story and those of so many other children who did not survive the residential schools will never be forgotten. Could Gladys' sisters and brothers please stand and be acknowledged? They are Judy Schellenberg, Connie Vincent, Faye Tris uh, Trisada, Ivor <laughs> Strongquist, and Helmer, also known as Sweet Strongquist. Thank you. Without your willingness to share your memories, we couldn't have done this work. I would also like to thank the survivors, some of whom are also here with us today, who had the strength and courage to continue to share their truths. As Grand Chief Edward John said after the apology by the Harper government, we collectively owe a deep sense of thanks and respect to all of these courageous men and women whose dignity was put on public display and ridiculed by an unbelie unbelieving government and unbelieving churches. Their brave actions paved the difficult road to the apology. Now I'd like to welcome the BCTF's Aboriginal Education Coordinator, Gail Stromquist, who has been the driving force behind this work, to tell us more. Thank you, Glenn. And thank you, Glenn, for your personal commitment to education for reconciliation, to working in communities and with partner groups to move this work forward. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me back there? No. 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 Oh, yeah. I'd also like to thank the BC Teachers Federation Executive Committee members who have shown tremendous commitment to this work. Without the support of the BC Teachers Federation, we could not have done the work with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and the Project of Heart, where hundreds of teachers and thousands of students respectfully honored the schools, the stories of the survivors to learn about the legacy of residential schools. The commemoration piece we created together to honor survivors is a beautifully tiled dugout canoe with over 6,000 tiles, each one created carefully in honor of the survivors and the children who never returned home. The tiles were created by students from across the province the canoe was carved by Slave Tooth Derek George and his family, and Una Ann Moyer, a Taltown artist sitting with us here today, mosaic the canoe with the students' work. Our commemoration canoe is now traveling across the province to ensure the story continues and this history is never hidden again. And in fact, it is just leaving Langley in a few days and it is uh, heading over, making its journey to uh, Comox. At this time, I would like to welcome Ernie, Michelle, and Yuna Ann Moyer um, up to the front. Um, we are honored to have them here. Um, they're going to um, help us open in a good way with an Inklakatma song. So, Ernie and Yuna, come up please. Thank you. 
and Josh question camp. For those that don't understand, my name is Coyote. And Josh Quest, uh, the Cupman. I come from Tuckham Chain. There's a place called Nahamanak, storytelling place. It's a great honor to be here today to come and witness this the ceremony, the celebration. The beginning of a a career for Gladys, even though she's not here to tell her story, to share her truth. As all the residential school students that have gone, they're all here to share their truth. I shared my truth, and I won my court case. One of the 13 from Lickton, St. George's. But it's a great honor to be here today. I see a lot of hand drums here. Can I ask them to come on up? For this is a celebration, we need that drum circle. We need that medicine. For this isn't just about us. But each and every one of us have the medicine, the inner strength to do what we do. <coughs> and I've been taught that all the songs that we sing are prayer songs. The song that I'm going to share today comes from a very special place. It comes from the Stein Valley. It's one of the three sacred rivers in the Sakapmak territory where our healers used to go to train, to work, to vision quest. That is the Stein Valley, Kosametko, Siska Creek, and Hoyik, and Kayik. Those are the three main rivers that our ancestors used to go and to pray. The song that I'm about to share comes from the Stein Valley. It's a song that I used to pray and give thanks to the Creator for all that we have. From the families, the children, the grandchildren, our friends, our homes, everything that we own is a gift from the Creator. I even pray and I give thanks to the Creator for the gift of life this day for each and every one of us. For it is a gift. That's why they call it the day of the present. Because it is a gift from the Creator. I, 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 oh.
thank all the brothers and sisters for, for coming up and helping out. It's always an honor to stand in a drum circle, to hear the medicine, to feel the strength. Hope you can. of the module. The module introduces Gladys and her community. The students learn that indigenous communities were intricately connected to the land and that a family and community were and continue to be so important. Many of us have learned about the 150,000 children who were in many cases forcibly removed from their homes to attend residential schools. But it's hard to conceive of 150,000, so this module is about one child so that students make a very personal connection to Gladys's life. <coughs> and it is through these connections that hearts and minds are changed, not only for the students who learn about her in such a personal way, but for their parents who learn this history from their children, the history that they were never taught. In fact, with the cooperation of the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation, we've made some more significant discoveries about family history. Gladys's sister, Maggie, who, also, who was also a student at Kamloops Residential School, just disappeared from the school's quarterly reports. There are no death records, and so we can only guess at her fate. We've also learned that the children in the Spasm communities were sent to four different residential schools divided along religious lines. The school in Lytton was Anglican, while St. Augustine's in Seashell, the Kamloops Residential School, and St. Mary's in Mission were all Catholic schools. In this 10 lesson module, the students <coughs> don't learn that Gladys died in residential school until lesson four. This particular lesson teaches the children in a very experiential way through a lesson called the Blanket Exercise, which is also one of our workshops, about colonization in Canada. Later lessons teach about the residential school experience, traditional approaches to education, resistance and resilience, and in the end, reflections on, how, on what we do now with the knowledge that we have. It's always important to close these teachings on a note of hopefulness and on actions that we can take together. This is a learning journey and we're learning more and more all the time as survivors come forward, scholars do their research, and family members continue to share their stories. It is now my pleasure to invite uh, James Hobart, our past chief from Spuzzum and a strong community leader, to share a few words. Jim has many interesting stories and carries much knowledge um, which has been passed down through our family about the Spuzzum community and the Inklakatma territory. And photos from his family were passed on for, um, for the Gladys module as well. Thank you. Thanks, Yeah. Can you hear me out there? Oh, I see some nods. Okay, thank you. First of all, I'd like to thank um, Kao and uh, Una for hosting the drum circle and also the, uh, for the Musqueam, Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh for their, letting us do this on their traditional territory. <coughs> Excuse me. I got a bit of that cold that's going around, so you can see me si sipping some water here. <laughs> I'd also like to say thank you for all the support for this from all the, from all the elders from Spuzzum. <clears throat> Most of what I'm going to share with you today, like Gail says, are some stories. I've never shared some of this stuff in public. It's some of the stories from Gladys' oldest brother. That's my grandfather. <clears throat> my mom was his oldest, uh, his oldest daughter. My mom's still alive. <clears throat> my grandpa passed away a few years ago. 
Uh, Grandpa shared many stories with me in the Fraser Canyon when we would be perched up on some, some bench or on a bluff, some of his favorite places. <clears throat> I know now that when I spend time in the same areas with, uh, with my sons, <clears throat> that he was trying to connect me to the past. But he loved gardening also. If anybody remembers Grandpa, he just loved gardening. And so if you ever wanted to get down to, to the heart of the matter, you'd, sit, you'd garden alongside him. <clears throat> Sometimes that's when he'd uh, share the most about some of the traumatic stories from me from residential school. That's when he felt open enough. You know, maybe it's because we're on the ground doing stuff, distracted. Anyway, can you imagine what it would have been like for him? He ran away from residential school, from the trauma. He told me some of the stuff that happened. A few years later, after he ran away, <coughs> he watched his uh, his little sister, Gladys. Well, we know the fate of Gladys. And then my oldest mom, or my, his oldest daughter, he had to send to the same residential school. Can you imagine the fear that that would have gone through him, knowing that what would have, would have happened? Like I said, sorry, some of the stuff I'm sharing my first time, and as I'm reading it, I can't believe that I set myself up to, to read some, some <laughs> stuff that was so emotional. <clears throat> so, um, my mom, uh, so, I, so I stand here, I think, not alone, but connected to my grandfather, to Gladys, to my mom, my cousins, and my elders. Uh, an intangible connection, perhaps. My grandfather would no doubt say that our eyes are ancient eyes that have witnessed the same beauty in the canyon, in the water, in nature, and in each other. Well, the government uh, made it a lot simpler. They called, uh, they gave us a number. I'm, a, I'm from 708. How many people know what that is? How many 708s are in here? All of, the, all of the people from Spasm are 708. That was the, the number we had stamped on us. A uh, treaty number, they called it. But we're more than that, aren't we? You know, our most uh, powerful connection is the proud ink of blood that runs through our, our veins. But isn't it uh, sad that, that we were born into an unexplainable shame just to have that blood running through us? You know, as if something was wrong with us. We are branded less than. <clears throat> My mom... My grandpa called her Hazum and Quenchton. Uh, I'm not going to try to spell it for you, but it meant biggest star in the Inklakut machine. She was his oldest daughter. It is his old. Well, my grandpa's passed away. My mom's still alive. She was five when she was taken to away, first to Kamloops and then to Mission. In recent years, I I was called upon to support my mom as she testified of the truth and reconciliation. And congratulations, you went, Kyle. At one point during the hearing, they asked us all to leave the room except for the Crown and her lawyer, because it was determined that some of the horror that she would be sharing <clears throat> uh, would not only extend the contempt for a system that would allow what she was about to share, but it, it would promote such indignity to a child. She, they just did not want us to carry that forward. Um, <clears throat> Albeit mom's part of the dis disposition told a true, truly triumph, and that's actually where Gail was tough, over uh, triumph over evil story. She recalled the day at the residential school feeling so incredibly weak and ready to give up, and, and I'm certain that most of her relatives, were the, her sisters and siblings were feeling the same way. When she was brought to the office, they dragged her to the office, and uh, there she saw my grandpa, and uh, her, that's her dad and uh, a couple other siblings and some, some other people from her community. And uh, he was there to take them home. It was just a very strange turn of events uh, with help, the uh, help of uh, some of the elders, dad, Charles Stromquist, and others. They funded a school in their native, in their, in their home community of Spuzzum. And they, they, they hired a teacher that could teach from grade one to 12. So that meant all of the kids could come back home. My mom says that shortly after the teacher left, I can't remember what the reason was, but they brought in a substitute that could only teach to grade six, but that was never spoken outside of the home because then all of the other kids would have been sent back. <laughs> Gail mentioned a time capsule, and somewhere at the old school there is a time capsule that my mom, my auntie was supposed to be here. She, she said she knows where it is. So before, I want to put together a committee to pursue this time capsule. Um, 
But the truth be told, when they ushered us out of the room that day, on uh, Mum's reconciliation uh, um, a testimony, I didn't have to be in the room because Mum lived. I lived with Mum witnessing what happened to her. She was transparent proof of how she was raised as a child. Like, uh, she was like, in some ways, she still is a, a child frozen in time. I honestly believe that <clears throat> had it not been for my dad, my mom would have ended up on the reserve and uh, stuck in the past, no doubt, uh, fear of the unknown, just because of her education in school. Um, <clears throat> you know, it's been said you can, you can observe the trauma of a kid by how they treat kids at that same age. Well, I watched my mom turn her back on almost every one of her grandchildren at five, and all of a sudden at 12, she wanted them back in her life with no explanation why, and I think that, that was the years that she was traumatized in the school system. So there was a strong echo. <clears throat> my dad, picture this, 12 years senior to my mom, he was a European bushman, he was a young tr uh, prospector, a trapper, a Sasquatch chaser, honestly, he actually was with the guy that wrote a book on it. And believe it or not, he was the head maitre d' at the copper room in the Harrison Hot Springs Hotel. Well, uh, he immediately saw when he, uh, my mom, the first time he saw the beauty, and he relentlessly pursued her. They both tell this part of the story different. Um, <laughs> after a year, my dad uh, frequenting the truck stop, the, the Hunter Creek, and I think, John, do you remember when my mom worked there, eh, John? Uh, I think you were telling me the story when my mom used to work over by uh, the Hunter Creek truck stop. I don't think this truck stop's there anywhere. Anyway, my dad pulled in with his Jeep, and he wanted to show my mom, who he knew was First Nations, his catch, and he pulled his tarp back on uh, two big black bear that he'd shot. Well, I'm going to say big. Uh, they were black bears, anyway. <clears throat> he was beaming with pride, while my mom, who was told by her dad that she was part of the bear clan, was not as impressed. <laughs> no matter, they still fell in love, and uh, they got married, and they moved to the remote woods of the surrounding Terrace, BC, where they lived off the land until uh, my oldest brother was three. My parents must have realized that they needed to be closer to uh, society when my mom was pregnant with my next oldest brother. So in the late 50s, they moved to the outskirts of Hope, back to my mom's traditional territory, where she gave birth to myself, my old, or my next older brother, Alex, myself, and, my, and finally my younger sister, who were all born under the age of three. Like, I'm 11 years younger than my next brother, and my, my sister was born on my, on my first birthday. <laughs> My dad went to UBC, became a teacher, and then as a teacher he moved us to the most remote areas of British Columbia, through the BC, Yukon. We were always drawn to the carefree life on the reserve, because every small community is attached to our, was attached to a reserve in the north, it seems. My siblings and I could always be found entrenched in some form of cultural endeavor with an elder. I remember, I was just telling Una this, my, the day that uh, my mom I, I said to my mom, what, is, what should I tell these people at Telegraph Creek? They're calling me Taltan. And she said, tell them thank you for the compliment. <laughs> so my mom, mom always had a big heart, and she knew what to say. She must have found tranquility in the safety of that uh, surround, those surroundings because she blossomed as an artist. I, I have one of her carvings here. I have a, a tooth or a claw of a, a grizzly that my dad had shot. My mom wasn't happy about that one either. <laughs> But anyway, I recall uh, my entire family driving year after year as my, uh, my dad was also my mom's number one promoter and number one fan of her artwork. He would, we would drive for days, and that's not as much about the distance as how slow my dad drove. <laughs> so we would drive to the PD where dad made sure that my mom's, he'd sent her work along ahead and uh, her art was, work was already on display. And each, each year it was clear <coughs> that my mom was humble yet elated to see her work set up before uh, we got there and already with several best of show ribbons and trophies awaiting her amongst hundreds of people wanting to get a chance to meet the artist. <clears throat> I recall like it was yesterday, my mom, was, that's, those are times when she was truly in the moment when people would come up and ask her about how, you know, how she got her ideas. I felt a sense of pride as she fought, overcame uh, came the pe people um, and the fear and for some reason, I was little, but my mom always looked taller when she was like that. I, don't, I can't explain it, but she looked like this. <clears throat> so one of the highlights I remember from back then 
And I forgot about this until I was just writing this and, and uh, going over my notes. Because my mom and I, uh, she worked with me for quite a few years in the log home industry. And uh, we talked a lot on the way there, on the way back to jobs and stuff. And so I remember when a British royal couple had come uh, and approached my parents at the p and &E and wanted to buy not just the work that was there, all her work, anything she'd ever done, they wanted to buy this. And so my mom, she was hesitant because she'd invested a small piece of her in every piece. I don't think she ever wanted to ever sell the stuff. But anyways, they convinced her that uh, she could put any price she wanted on her sentiment, and uh, so she did. And that year we left without her prize work, and the couple kept their word uh, that uh, they sent her uh, pictures, and I, I have these pictures of her craftsmanship hanging on display in, in the Buckingham Palace. So it was amazing. She, my mom said <clears throat> that while she was in residential school, the Queen's picture was always there overlooking her and uh, making her feel as though she was being watched at her every move, making sure she obeyed every rule that denied her to be culturally corrupt, uh, creative. Uh, and ironically, her work was now watching over the Queen's house. <laughs> <laughs> so I just want to say I'm very grateful that this important work is being done here in my lifetime. It's a great start. Uh, obviously, we still have a long way to go. I'd like to thank uh, Gail and Janet and everybody else that made it possible. Uh, so we all have a great responsibility to first try to comprehend and hopefully have helped uh, underst understand what it might have been like for an older brother and a, a father right afterwards, losing his sister to have to send his daughter there, <coughs> to comprehend the incredible adversity that the Indigenous people had to overcome and then reframe their place in history. Uh, that's, what, that's a task that we have as the incredible gems of the past that each one possesses and then edify the incredible strength they needed to endure the pressures of assimilation. They didn't, they didn't win, right? And I just want, uh, a while ago I was with uh, 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 Premier Clark and she stated that when her ancestors came to Canada, they arrived in a very bitter cold winter. And some of you may have heard this. They nearly froze and had very little, little food. They found both food and uh, warmth in the sanction of the a small First Nation village on uh, Vancouver Island, as she stated, the First Nations could have survived without her family, but there was no way her ancestors could have survived without the First Nations. And um, finally, uh, it's been said that a society's health isn't determined by its strongest nor its weakest members, but by the distance in between. In my culture, each one of us knows what it's like to feel that undermining shame. When I see a homeless, less fortunate person, I can't. Uh, we can't look away for the shadows. That, uh, um, for in the shadows of the alley, we may see our own eyes looking back. So they may be First Nations, right? And we have to, you can't just walk by that. <clears throat> Finally, um, my grandpa was a, an amazing storyteller. If anybody remembers, he was a little tiny man. And up until the day he died, he, used to, he, used to, he lost his driver's license. And uh, he would sneak around Highway 7. And they'd come and see me. And then he'd make it so I'd have to drive because he didn't want to get stopped. He'd come to my work, and I worked for a Japanese company. They all thought he was Japanese. So as soon as he drove in, it was, and they have a very high respect for their elders as well. So as soon as he drove in the yard, they were like, stop everything. James has to go with his grandpa. So it was very nice that they allowed me that time to, to spend driving around with my grandpa, hearing the stories. I can never get enough of his soft voice. I don't know if you remember, he had some very unusual uh, grandpa-isms, expressions, very endearing. And I'm forever ever grateful to have those gifts uh, indelibly printed in my mind. And so in some ways, I hope I've honored my grandfather and his story by telling you this story this afternoon. And in my language, and uh, Kyle's language, uh, we, we either say kukshem or uh, homa to express my thank you for you being here. And so kukshem, thank you for you. Uh, have now had the opportunity to go on field trips to learn about Gladys's life and to plant heart gardens around her grave to honor her memory. In fact, two more classes just planted more hearts on Wednesday this week in Spasm. 
I won't mention anything about the snakes that we ran into. <laughs> the comments that come from the students and their parents after learning about us' story are very moving. Children fully understand injustice at a very young age, and they give us so much hope as future leaders. time we would like to ask um, our family members up. Auntie Connie, Auntie Faye, Auntie Judy, Uncle Iver, and Uncle Swede, please. And if we can have our committee come up as well. And your question, Jeff, and ask all the other hand to come on up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank
in closing, um, I would like to acknowledge some of those who contributed to the Gladys module. Um, a huge thanks to my brother Carl, um, whose beautiful art um, has made both the project heart and especially the Gladys module. We never knew publication so special, and he's been so generous with his work, and we're so thankful. Thank you, Carl, and thank you to my sister Janet, who at the AGM a few years ago started designing the tribute to Gladys through the Project to Heart tiles that are on the front cover. And he does much of the work with the family tree um, for our family. Um, I'd also like to thank um, the Aboriginal Education Advisory Team, and uh, they, they can all wave to you. They're the ones who are doing all of the work today. Um, <laughs> Thank you so much for your the amazing support you've uh, given me through all of this. And uh, I also have to say a thanks to um, Jean Moyer, uh, who the, the, that was where the, the Gladys module was piloted, and Jean did so much work um, to um, help with that. Thank you so much, Jean. And Pascal, and uh, there's Pascal over here and Cheryl Carlson as well. Um, I'd also um, have many thanks to the staff at the BCTF as well, but Moira has a few words that she wants to share, and so um, I raise my hands to all of you in thanks. And um, uh, I'd like to int now introduce you to our Executive Director, Moira McKenzie, to say a few closing words. Moira has also been there and has provided me with tremendous support and encouragement through this um, for the committee and for all of the work that I've done with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Thank you so much, Moira. If she had lived, Gladys would have turned 99 years old yesterday. And um, I wonder what she would have been thinking about uh, all of the province uh, learning about her story. Um, Gladys and Maggie, you aren't forgotten. very much, Gail. So in closing this important ceremony, I want to express my deep gratitude to Gladys's family members for sharing her story and allowing us to share it with teachers and students in return. We're so privileged that you've trusted us with this incredibly powerful and incredibly sad story. We promise to honor that trust. We promise to honor Gladys's life, and we promise to tell the story of how and why she died. We know it's a story that's deeply personal and completely representative of the genocidal policies practiced against Aboriginal people in this province and this country. I believe we need to know all of the individual stories, as well as the setting and the scale of the racism and abuse in which they took place. It helps us to help future generations understand the impact on children and families and why those stories are so important today. In reading Gladys's story over and over, I kept coming back to pages 90 and 91 in this book. These pages show the letter that was sent in 1925 from Patrick Charlie on behalf of the families at Spasm, asking the Indian agent to help the community open their own school. His compelling words explain how much better it would have been to have the school open in the community and the children with their families at home. He even asked the agent to come and see the school for himself. To make his case, he includes the list of the 21 children who would be able to attend that school. The response was to take the attached list of children and to tell the people of Spasm to get those children ready to be taken away to Kamloops Indian Residential School. I've read that part of the book over and over and tried to take in that response. It was a devastating betrayal and it's happened in many places and many, many times over. Patrick Charlie's letter was written in 1925, but I see it as a call on us today. 
the hope that was expressed in that letter is the same hope today, that we will recognize the fundamental need and the right of Aboriginal students and their families to be welcomed into schools with respect, schools that value them, that help them feel at home, and to help them know that they belong. The appeal of that letter from 1925 is a very strong message that every Aboriginal child and youth must see their identity and their culture and their history represented in their classes and their schools, and there can be no betrayal of that appeal today. Thank you so much to Gladys's family for your permission and for collaborating with us to help us act on the appeal. Thank you to Carl Stromquist for your incredible generosity with your art. I know that Gail has acknowledged all of the members that were involved in the project and I also want to say thank you. And I want to thank the BCTF staff who worked on this resource and its predecessor, the Project of Heart Book. Gail Stromquist, Nancy Knickerbocker, Miranda Light, Chris Stewart, Dale Costanzo, and Louis Isadora. Your leadership and commitment has really made a world of difference. And as always, we really do owe a big debt of gratitude to Charlene Bearhead for her enduring support and guidance. And to each of you here today who have come to celebrate this important resource and play tribute to Gladys's life and her story, thank you very much for being here.
Jawab pasien siap. Datang. It's a borrow ton. Have any of you seen that movie where the spirit lives? It's about the residential school in Alberta. That song belongs to the young lady. She sang it for a friend. Her friend ran away from school because she heard her family was going to a Sundance. So she ran for four days and four nights and she didn't make it. And when her friend heard that her friend perished, she went to the top of the, the residential school into a little room. She lit her smudge, sweet grass, and she prayed. And she sang that song. She sang that song to us, the Creator, to let it be that her friend will make it into the spirit world. So I thought it would be appropriate to finish a ceremony off singing that song where the spirit lives because that's where a lot of us is. That she lives on in all the people that she left behind, all her siblings, the grandchildren, the great-grandchildren. But her spirit still lives on. So I thought it would just be appropriate to share that song where the spirit lives to, to honor Gladys and to honor her family that are here. Aho Kukstam.
Thank you. 